Hello mga ka -ekop. I am Jose Roland Moya. The Employers Confederation of the Philippines, or ECOP, is here to ensure that your voice as employers is heard, articulated, and acted upon. ECOP addresses industrial relations issues, promotes social dialogue, and fosters proactive collaboration among employers and stakeholders. We are here to help employers become responsible, sustainable, and inclusive. ECOP has dual functions. First is its advocacy and lobbying role on labor and social policy issues on behalf of employers before the executive and legislative branches of the government. Second is the delivery of direct services, including training, capacity building, consultancy, provision of information, among others. By the way, huwag po kayong aalis. Manood po tayo sa buong programa. Sagutin ang aming Echo Plus question for the day. I-post ang tamang sagot sa Facebook account ng Echo at manalo ng premyo. May I introduce to you my co-host in our episode of our digital TV program, Attorney Lorenzo Enzo Ziga, Professorial Lecturer of the University of the Philippines School of Labor and Industrial Relations, or SULAIR. Maraming salamat, Roland, sa pagkakataong ito. Mga ka eco welcome to Echo Plus, amplifying your voice every other Monday at 5.30 p.m. Ang episode natin ngayon ay tungkol sa security of tenure or seguridad sa panunungkulan. Ang karapatang ito ay nakatadhana sa ating saligang batas at sa labor code. Ang buod ng karapatang ito ay ang uh, lahat ng manggagawa ay nag -e enjoy ng security of tenure at maari lamang tanggalin sa kanilang trabaho uh, dahil sa just or authorized causes upon observance of due process. Alamin pa natin ang iba pang mga impormasyon tungkol sa karapatang ito mula sa ating mga panauhin maya-maya. Ang unang makakasama natin ay si Undersecretary Benjo Benavides. Attorney Benjo Santos Benavides is the Undersecretary of Labor Relations, Social Protection and Policy Support Cluster ng Department of Labor and Employment. Hello Undersecretary Benjo, welcome to Echo Plus, amplifying your voice. Please say hello sa mga ka ekop natin na nanunood ngayon. Hi Sir Roland, uh, good evening to all. To our partner of course, ECOP, and sa ating mga taga-subaybay sa ECOP lang. Uh, Yusek Benjo, for the first question. Uh, what laws in our country govern and guarantee security of tenure? Well, there are two basic laws in the country relative to security of tenure. One, of course, is the fundamental law, our constitution, the 1987 Philippine Constitution. Because under the constitution, nakasaad po dyan, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property. Ang atin pong trabaho ay maituturing pong property. So no one shall be deprived of that property property right employment without due process of law. The other law is of course the Labor Code of the Philippines. Nakapaloob naman po dyan na ang mga manggagawa ay may kasiguraduhan sa trabaho o yung security of tenure. But let me amplify this concept of security of tenure. Security of tenure does not mean perpetual employment. It is simply defined as the right of a worker not to be dismissed without reason and without due process of law. Dalawang aspeto po yung ano, ano, security of tenure, yung tinatawag na substantive at uh, procedural due process uh, based sa yung uh, sinabi Ayusek uh, Benjo. Pwede po bang paki- Yes, that's accurate, uh, Sir Roland. Two aspects of due process. First one is on the substantive aspect. Dapat po may rason. Ano ba yung mga rason na pwedeng ikatanggal ng isang manggagawa? Under the Labor Code, we have what we so-called the authorized causes and the just causes. Ano po itong mga just causes na ito? Ito yung mga offenses or omissions ng isang empleyado, katulad ng sabay na may misconduct. 
siya ba ay habitually delinquent. These are just causes. Under the same labor code, meron din po tayong tinatawag na authorized causes. So, ang isang empleyado ay maaaring matanggal kung ang isang kumpanya ay mag-implement ng redundancy program, mag-install ng labor-saving devices, o mag-retrench to prevent loss, o kaya magsara. Yung pagsasara po, ito po ay nasa discretion o nasa decision ng may-ari ng negosyo. Now, this is the first aspect of due process. The second one is, of course, procedural. Kahit po may rason po tayo para tanggalin ang isang empleyado, kailangan pong dumaan po ito sa tamang proseso. Ano po ba ang mga tamang proseso? When it comes to just causes, kailangan po nating padalhan po siya nung tinatawag po nating first notice. The first notice is actually the charge. Ito po yung complaint. Doon po inilalahad what are the offenses, what are the charges, What are the acts or omissions committed by the employee? Binibigyan po siya ng pagkakataon na i-defend yung kanyang sarili. And of course, the second notice. The second notice is basically the decision on the charge. Siya ba ay guilty or not? Kung siya po ay guilty, then the employer may impose penalty. What are the penalties that an employer may impose? The ultimate penalty is of course termination. But in the exercise of management prerogative, pwede rin po niyang instead of termination, isuspend lang, i-demote, or i-reassign, or even bigyan lang po ng warning. With respect naman po sa tinatawag po natin authorized causes, there are required procedural process to be observed. Unang-una po dyan yung notice. Notice to the Department of Labor and Employment 30 days before the effectivity of the termination. And another notice to the employee 30 days prior to the effectivity of the termination. But aside from the notice requirement, kailangan din po magbayad ng tinatawag po nating separation pay. I need to clarify this. Separation pay is only mandated to be paid to employees who are terminated by reason of authorized causes. Unless otherwise, uh, yung mga resigning employee o yung mga natatanggal for some other reason ay pinagkakalooban pa ng isang mabait na employer ng tinatawag nating separation pay. So basically, Sir Roland, yun po yung konsepto ng due process when it comes to the right of workers to security of tenure. Yusek, palalimin lang natin. Who are entitled to security of tenure and why is security of tenure important to workers? Palagay ko, ito yung talagang uh, mananatili sa ating manunood uh, sa mga pagtatalakay natin ngayon. Uh, maraming salamat po, attorney, and so for that question. Well, I, I need to clarify this. Contrary to uh, misconception, ang, ang pagkakaalam kasi ng lahat o ang karamihan, Right to security of tenure is only available to regular employees. That is a misconception because non-regular employees such as even a probationary employee or a contractual employee or a seasonal employee or a fixed term employee, they do have the right to security of tenure. Because during the period of the season or the fixed term or the project, they cannot be dismissed without just and authorized causes. So essentially, lahat po ng manggagawa ay may karapatan sa kasiguraduhan sa trabaho. Again, I need to clarify this. Security of tenure does not mean perpetual employment. Security of tenure only means that an employee cannot be dismissed without just or authorized cause and without observance of procedural due process. So, lahat po ng manggagawa ay may karapatan sa security of tenure. Bakit po ito mahalaga? Mahalaga po ito because, again, under the Constitution, employment, yung trabaho po natin, is considered property, pag-aari, possession. Without the, This is, to many, the only means of their livelihood. Kung aalisin po natin itong uh, trabaho sa kanila, paano pa po sila mabubuhay? Paano po sila mabubuhay ng marami? Uh, Yusek Benjo, kahit ba mga managerial uh, employees ay meron ding security of tenure? Yeah, that's correct, uh, Sir Roland. Whether you are a rank and file, a uh, supervisory employee, or a managerial employee, meron po silang karapatan to security of tenure. 
But then again, when with respect to managerial employees, hindi po masyadong stricto po tayo doon sa mga grounds. Because as a managerial employee, the employer expect a managerial employee to function in the interest or in behalf of the employer. Marami pong mga desisyon ng Korte Suprema kung saan ang isang manager ay natanggal dahil po sa mga uh, grounds provided for under the Labor Code of the Philippines. Pero hindi po nangangahulugan na kapag ang isang empleyado ay managerial employee ay wala na siyang karapatan sa kasiguraduhan sa trabaho. Um, Yusek Benjo, sa panahon ng pandemia, anong mga issues sa related sa security of tenure ang kinaharap ng mga employers at uh, mga workers natin? We understand that there were uh, a couple of labor advisories, department orders, are released by the Department of Labor and Employment that uh, dwelled, for example, on furlough and uh, termination, which uh, affected uh, the security of tenure. Uh, kindly elaborate. Well, uh, two points. The first point is that during the pandemic, we noticed increase in reports from establishments or employers notifying the department of implementation of termination of employees based on retrenchment and closure of establishment. So it, it is a limitation to the right of workers to security of tenure. Mawawalan po sila ng trabaho, but it is a valid exercise of managed prerogative. Yes, it is. Kasi uh, marami naman po talagang kumpanya ang nagsara, lalong-lalo na yung mga maliliit. There is no question to the right of employers or establishment to close down its business. Ang gobyerno po, hindi po natin minamandatuhan ang mamamayan na magnegosyo. Ganun din, wala din pong pumoy persa po sa kanilang magpatuloy ng isang negosyo. But the moment they decide to close down partially or totally their business, meron po mga karampatang uh, regulasyon na kailangan po sundin. The other, the other point is on for low, yung tinatawag po natin under the labor code na Uh, loading, ito po yung temporary suspension of employment relation. This is also a limitation on uh, the right to security of tenure because under this uh, concept, while it is true that there is no termination, there is no work. So meron po tayong konsepto na employed yet without work. Without work considering that employers may bona fide temporarily suspend business operation for a period of six months. Ito po yung nakapaloob sa Labor Code of the Philippines. But if you recall last year, the department issued a department order allowing the parties to a contract of employment, of course, ito po yung empleyado at ang kanyang employer, to extend the period of floating status from six months to another six months. So ito naman po ay voluntaryong kasunduan ng dalawang partido ng isang kontrata na tinatawag po natin na uh, employment. So these are, these are the two contentious issues that we encountered uh, last year. Ngayon po medyo bumabalik na yung mga manggagawa. But last year, maraming reklamo ang nakarating po sa amin na nagsara yung kumpanya. Well, uh, what we can advise workers is that just ensure that you receive the benefit due them in case of closure. And that is one, the notice, uh, rather the payment of separation pay. And of course, the final pay, this is the pay for the uh, days keep rendered prior to the termination. Uh, magandang paglilinaw po yun Yusek Benjo kasi uh, marami po akong natatanggap na katanungan uh, sa mga workshop o sa mga training at uh, isa na nga po itong usapin tungkol doon sa Porlo na mukhang uh, kinakailangan linawi ng konte At isa pa po ang madalas na tinatanong eh nag marami daw bang pagbabago ngayon sa pandemic tungkol doon sa Uh, pagpapatupad ng labor code o ng iba pang uh, panuntunan tungkol sa pagawa. Uh, siguro po ito yung tamang pagkakataon para masagot na ninyo itong uh, puntong ito. Well, to, to, to my mind, 
uh, wala namang masyadong pagbabago the way we enforce and implement rules and regulation when it comes to labor and employment except on matters of occupational safety and health standards. Because if you recall, together with other government agencies such as DPI, DIL, JTOH, naglabas po ang kagawaran ng, ng mga guidelines patungkol po sa uh, Uh, kung ano yung mga pwedeng gawin in order to prevent or control the spread of COVID-19 not only in public places but specifically in workplaces. So ito po yung nabago uh, dun po sa, sa mga regulasyon, sa mga batas na ini-implement po ng DOL. And also, this protocol also changed the way we do conduct inspection. Uh, may mga inspection po kami that we limit the, the coverage of the inspection to the minimum health protocols to the guidelines. Kasi po ito po yung mas pangangailangan. Early this year, bago po, uh, actually ito na rin nga po siguro yung reason kung bakit tumaas po yung nagkaroon po ng surge. Not only because of the Delta, but because uh, there were reports of cases or cluster of cases in workplaces. So, kami po sa Dole, we wanted uh, companies to reopen and resume operation, but we wanted them to do so safely. So, ngayon pong taon, medyo nag stricto po tayo kasama yung DOH, DILG, and DTI dun po sa pagpapatupad ng minimum public health protocol. But late this year, medyo uh, nagkakampati ata tayo eh. So, so sana we, we continue to observe and to comply with the minimum public health protocol, especially so that we have a new variant. Ito lang po yung pakiusap po talaga namin, uh, continuance of observance of companies with respect to minimum public health protocol. This is for the safety of the workplace and their workers. Yeah, Yusuf Benjo, susugan ko na yung uh, binanggit mo tungkol sa uh, labor uh, uh, inspection because uh, labor laws uh, won't mean anything without uh, enforcement and uh, implementation. Uh, in line with this, can you tell us about the visitorial and uh, enforcement power of the Secretary of uh, Labor that is provided for under the Labor Code of the Philippines? Bakit po ito mahalaga? Well, uh, in governance, alam natin, uh, government uh, promulgates rules and regulation. Congress enacts legislation. Uh, ang presidente po, ina-approvan po niya yung mga bills passed by Congress. But these measures are nothing without this being enforced. So under the Labor Code of the Philippines, marami po tayong standards. The, the only way to enforce this is for the Secretary for the Department of Labor and Employment to be given that power to first visit company. So pwede po niyang puntahan yung mga enterprises, yung mga establishment. Any time of the day, whenever there is work being undertaken, kapag may trabaho. So anumang oras po yan, alo naman po ng umaga, o alas 10 po ng gabi, pwede pong mag-inspect ang Department of Labor and Employment. That is the visitorial power uh, aspect of Article 128. The other portion of Article 128 of the Labor Code of the Philippines is the enforcement power. Paano po nagkakaroon ng enforcement power? If as a result of the exercise of the visitorial power, meron pong nakita mga deficiencies o kaya violation, dun po sa standards enforced by the Department of Labor. Ang Secretary of Labor po, pwede po siyang o through his or her authorized representative, pwede po siyang mag-issue ng mga orders. This is uh, commonly known as compliance order. Issued against companies who are who have deficient compliance to comply. Uh, ito po yung ini-issue ng mga regional directors po natin against uh, earring establishment or companies. So that's the, that is the enforcement power. That order issued by the regional director under the rules, yung po ay appealable naman sa Secretary of Labor. And the decision of the Secretary of Labor, recognizing the hierarchy of judicial system in the country, pwede din po itong dalhin o elevate sa Court of Appeals and all the way up to the Supreme Court. In our jurisdiction, the final arbiter of all questions, especially legal question. You said uh, in 2017, the DOLE issued the 
the rules on uh, the new rules on contracting and subcontracting department order 174 um medyo mainit na usapin ito no but how does uh, contracting and subcontracting as well as the new rules impact on security of tenure uh, what should employers keep in mind about uh, this regulation Yeah, okay. Tama po yun, uh, attorney. And so, in 2017, uh, the department issued Department Order 174. It is such a, I may say, a contentious measure. Uh, contentious in the sense that uh, meron pong nagbabangga ang interest. But we issued that primarily because uh, we need to further protect the rights of workers to security of tenure. One particular amendment provided for under DO-174 is the fact that the workers of the contractor are regular employees of the, con- the same contractor. Dati po kasi uh, under the previous issue ones, coterminus po yung employment ng mga contractors employee uh, in the sense that after the expiration of the service contract between the contractor and the principal tapos na rin po yung employee ng mga manggagawa we change that ang gusto po natin ituring ng mga regular na empleyado ng contractor hindi ng principal ulitin ko ituring ng mga regular na empleyado ng contractor ang kanyang mga manggagawang deployed to the principal And their employment should not expire or end by the mere reason that the service contract with the principal already expired or end. Yeah, Yusek, uh, Benjo, balikan ko yung uh, pinag-usapan natin kanina tungkol dun sa enforcement uh, power ng Secretary of Labor and uh, Employment. Saan po ba nahihirapan ang mga employers? Lalo na yung mga micro, small, and medium Uh, enterprises in terms of uh, labor laws uh, compliance? Yeah. Compliance will always be an issue. But based on the inspection conducted by the department, karaniwang nahihirapan ang mga employer, lalong-lalo na yung mga maliliit na negosyo, pagdating po sa compliance, sa occupational safety and health standards. These standards are not actually new. But under this administration na ipasa po natin yung Occupational Safety and Health uh, Act, ito po yung OSHLO, uh, we intensified the stand, yung enforcement. Binago po natin yung mga ibang standards. We clarify existing standards as to its applicability and coverage. Sa atin po kasi, maliit man o malaki, mayroon siyang mga manggagawa. And whether, regardless of size, lahat po ng employer ay kailangan pong mag-comply sa occupational safety and health standard. Since bago po ito, karamihan po sa mga employer, lalong-lalo na yung mga maliliit, hindi pa alam yung mga bagong standards when it comes to occupational safety and health. Lalong-lalo na ngayong panahon ng pandemya. Because we added more standards if only to curb the spread of the virus. So, kapag tayo po ay nagmo-monitor o nag-i-inspect, nakikita po talaga natin hirap po sila. Again, some of the standards carry with it cost. So, may may gastusin po ito. Ngayong pandemya, lalong-lalo na. So, doon po. But then again, ang, ang prinsipyo naman po namin dito, for deficient employers, and for uh, employers with noted violation. Our policy now, this time of the pandemic, is not to penalize them. May penalty po yung, yung batas, uh, yung violation po ng batas. But then again, instead of the department penalizing these employers, especially the small ones, the micro-enterprises, mas tinutulungan po namin sila to comply through uh, technical advice and uh, assistance from our, no less, the inspectors and the technical staff of our regional offices. Yusek Benjo, your parting words, please. Uh, well, thank you. My, my parting word is uh, a message of thank to ECOP for inviting the Department of Labor in this uh, program, ECOP Plus. This will uh, indeed uh, amplify your voice. So this, all, this venue will also clarify things or concepts Uh, lalong-lalo na po sa usapin po ng uh, security of tenure. But th- my other message is an appeal, uh, appeal to the workers, to the employee, get 
vaccinated. And my third one is also a, a challenge to employers. Let's continue to observe minimum public health protocol. The only way for us to go back to the pre-pandemic level of business is to keep our workplaces safe and to ensure that our workers are healthy. Yun lamang po. Maraming salamat at magandang gabi sa ating lahat. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Yusek Benjo. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, keep safe. Salamat. Salamat, Attorney Enzo. Salamat, Sir Roland. Thank you for a fruitful discussion under Secretary Benjo Benavides. Now for our next guest, Attorney Ranulfo Payos. Vice President of the Employers Confederation of the Philippines, or ECOP. Hello, sir. Welcome to ECO Plus Amplifying Your Voice. Say hello to our ECO Plus Amplifying Your Voice viewers. Hello, Roland. Hello, Attorney Ziga. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you in this program. Good evening to all of you. And so, uh, why don't you ask the first question? The labor code was enacted at a time when uh, there was no globalization yet and there was no internet. Uh, it also contains a provision that in case of doubt, uh, that doubt will be resolved in favor of labor uh, when interpreting the provisions of the labor code. What, is your, what are your thoughts on this? This provision in the labor code, specifically Article 4, sounds like unfair to the employer or to the capitalist. But really, there is an underlying reason for that under the so-called social justice. Social justice, as defined by Justice Laurel in the Supreme Court, landmark Supreme Court decision made before the war, before the Second World War, was a long definition. But if you try to capsulize that into one sentence, it simply affords equal protection to workers under the assumption that workers, even if they are considered as our social partners, are lesser in, in life than those than the capitalists. So follow the dictum of Mang Tsai Tsai, who said that those who have less in life should be given more in law. That is what is meant by social justice citizens. So uh, in case of doubt, in the interpretation and application of the law, all laws, as a matter of fact, it shall always be a result in favor of labor. But keep in mind that this is only applicable if there is real doubt. But if the law is very clear and does not need any interpretation at all, there is no need to interpret in other way. Attorney Payos, uh, ano po ba ang masasabi ninyo tungkol sa mga provisions ng uh, labor code patungkol sa security of uh, tenure. From an employer's perspective, what are some of the difficulties in complying with the security of tenure provisions uh, found in the labor code of the Philippines? What the security of tenure is properly defined in the labor code, I think is in Article 293 that no person or employee could be terminated except it authorized by law or due to valid costs. And it is further amplified under Article 297, not 296 and 297. And these are the valid causes, just causes. And the other one is authorized causes. Those are the two. In addition to that, it is not only enough that you must satisfy the so-called substantive due process, meaning it is anchored on the just causes as provided for by the labor code or authorized causes, you must satisfy also the so-called procedural due process. In short, it's not enough to base it only on the just causes, but you must follow the due process, meaning giving the employee a chance to explain the side and also to be able to confront witnesses if there are any, and even to demand for the assistance of the union officer, if it is unionized, or even demand for the assistance of counsel. That is the procedural due process requirement. In addition to that, 
as, as decided in the Supreme Court, the procedural due process includes that you must have the twin, observe the twin written notice rule. In short, right, you must put in writing, if there is an offender of your rules and regulations, you must write to the employee, explain why he should be subject to disciplinary action, which might include termination, and after that reply made by the employee or after the investigation, if the company decides that he is guilty, then the company must also report that in writing that he is terminated for employment. Actually, this, uh, this uh, security tenure is uh, anchored on the constitutional provision which says that no person can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. Property there, your job, or a job by the employee or a person is considered as a property. And you cannot be deprived of your property without a due process. So that's the whole concept of security tenure. But unfortunately, on the issue of contractualization, our friends in the labor sector try to change that definition that everybody who comes in must be regular. This is not in accordance with the law. This is not in accordance with the intention of the framers of the Constitution. I hope that answers your question. Because uh, let me let me fight. Let me let me let me let me expand a little bit. Because of the issue of contractualization, if you have to listen to the to the voice of the trade unions and some of our legislators, they want that everybody who comes in must be regular at once after passing the proportional period. But you cannot just do that. That is a bit practice. They have to undergo some certain kind of observation process for evaluation whether they really qualify for all the standards required for a job. And besides, you know, contractualization is a worldwide phenomenon. Maybe I should expand that further if there are other further questions regarding that. Uh, related the uh, attorney pious dun sa contractualization. If I remember it right in 2017. The Department of Labor and Employment issued DO 174. Hindi ba na Correct. on Correct. contracting and subcontracting? Hindi ba naliwanag itong mas napaliwanag o mas uh, inayos yung mga issues? You know, uh, Roland, there is a background for that. It started, the controversy started during the debate, the presidential debates, and the gong, the president, uh, the third at the time promised that if elected, I will abolish contractualization. But what's probably trying to mean was he will abolish the 555 or the Indo. But 555 and Indo is already illegal. Uh, you know what you mean by Indo, right? Indo means at the end of the contract before the six months period, you are terminated. And 555 is to ensure that you have signed a contract that your 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 service must not exceed five months. After five months, you're out. That is sort of illegal. But for characterization, Roland, is legal. That is authorized under Article 106 of the Labor Code. Of course, there are limitations now. Because of that controversy, because of that promise, the trade unions were expecting that once elected, President Duterte would try to influence Congress to enact a law to abolish that. And in the meantime, before Congress acted on that, there was a draft. And you know, the draft was started, you know, June 2017. President Duterte started to serve as new president. It was drafted Guru, about one or two months after. We were discussing the TIPC almost frequently as every other month until it reached to the time of February of 2017. And after so much hated debates, you know, Secretary Bailey said, because he was accused by the trade, labels, the trade unions, the president has ordered you to avoid his contractualization. Why are you put in this trap? This is unacceptable to us. And the answer of Secretary Bailey is, well, I presented this to the president. And for him, 
to approve her plea and what did the president told me it's up to you Ramallah so after that after so much meetings and all that Secretary Bello issued one Smith IV now what are the essential features of one Smith IV in relation sir to security of tenure pardon me uh, in relation to security of tenure in re- relation to the contract relation issue okay is that what you're saying no um can you please relate uh, the salient provisions of yes. to the salient features of the provisions of 174 is number one the capitalization was increased from 1 million to i think 3 or 5 million Okay, and the registration all service contracting companies must register, and they must pay a service fee of registration fee of hundred thousand. I think origin before that it was only fifty thousand, and the registration is valid for two years. In addition to that, in reply to the clamor of the trade unions that people are serving or being outsourced. By a contractual service company, do not enjoy the rights or the freedom of association and collective bargaining. There is a proviso in that the ones with the four that they have the right, they have the right to organize a union to their principal because their their employer is the service contracting company, and they have the right to strike. They have the right also to collective bargaining, and they have the security tenure. Now, what the security tenure means here? In that provision, if the principal of that service company says that we don't no longer need your employees, that service, that contracting service company, has to find another job, relocate him somewhere else among other clients, and within, if within the six months he cannot find any job for these guys who are displaced, this can be considered as having been terminated. And they are entitled to separation pay. In short, what the regular employees are enjoying, they are also enjoying. They must also be covered by the SSS by all legally mandated benefits. Attorney In short, Bias, it tries to remove the sale out of the argument of the trade unions that these outsourced employees do not enjoy security tenure, do not enjoy the benefits enjoyed. Under the law, they are enjoying that. The only difference, perhaps, that if you belong to a rich company, the regular employees enjoy much, much better benefits. That I must admit, that is the difference. Let me pursue that uh, point you raised on the phenomenon of contracting and subcontracting. Why is uh, contracting and subcontracting an option in the workplace at this time? And um, Why is a reassessment of this uh, factor uh, necessary at this point? Given the fact that uh, the proposed uh, uh, security of tenure bill, uh, which uh, uh, focused on endo, was vetoed by the president several years ago. You know, it depends. Right now, the employers have the right to outsource anybody. The only limitation is number one: the contracting service uh, company must be sufficiently capitalized, and as I described to you, the features that I cited in D one seventy four dash seventeen, the capitalization means that either they own the machinery or the other equipment, or they must be capitalized for at least five million. Okay, number two. They are assigned in jobs that are not directly related to the principal place of business. Now, this has been interpreted by the Supreme Court in the leading case of uh, Kimberly Clark that what is meant by directly related principal business, meaning the peripheral activities of the company, which are not integral part of the principal business of the company, can be outsourced. Example: You are a manufacturing company. The warehousing can be outsourced. The materials that are supplied to the manufacturing can be outsourced. The packaging can be outsourced. The delivery can be outsourced. That is when when by that. So the only limitations that it must be sufficiently capitalized and. And uh, DO one seventy four has defined that. What is the sufficient capitalization? Two. The 
جب سے طرح سائن دیتے ہیں مثبت دیٹ بی ریلیٹڈ ٹو دی پرنسپل بزنس آف دی کمپنی بٹ اٹ ہیز بین انٹرپریٹیڈ آلریڈی بائی دی سیکرٹ کورٹ وٹ از مین بائی دیٹ آلسو اٹ از ویری امپورٹنٹ دیٹ دی فور فولڈ ٹیسٹ ماس بی ابزرو وٹ آر دی فور فولڈ ٹیسٹ دی ہائرنگ سپروویژن دی پیمنٹ دی سیلریز ماس بی ڈن بائی دی سروس کنٹریکٹنگ کمپنی not by the principal and also the methods what is only the concern the principal is the results of the of the job done by these by this what by these uh, people who are provided for by the outsourcing company or the job contractor or subcontractor okay sir let me take off from the fourfold test that you mentioned Uh, what practical advice can you give to employers and IR HR practitioners so that they are that they observe and comply with the laws on the security of tenure of their employees? Simple. Always maintain that some kind of what you call that uh, distance, a kind of. Uh, relationship that they are not really their employees. They are outsourced by another company. And if they don't like the performance of that employee, or that employee has done something which is unpleasant to the principal, they cannot just say, you're fired, or you are under investigation. They cannot do that. Because once they do that, that means that they are their employees. Their best advice to them is if they are not happy with the outsourced people, they just have to get in touch with the servicing company and tell them that to remove this guy or subject him to investigation because in our company, he was always late or he stole something or he fought with other people, etc. But never, never, do the act of firing or investigation. Because if you do that, you are already exercising the so-called employer-employee relationship. They are not your employees. They are employees of the manpower service company. So observe that kind of distance. And observe the so-called fourfold test. Yeah, Attorney Pius, uh, do you believe that uh, the provisions of the Labor Code of the Philippines on security of tenure and uh, contracting and subcontracting should be changed, amended, or revised? I don't think there should be any change. Number one, it is already fair. It is very clear there that it is allowed by law and there are limitations. In the second paragraph of that particular provision, the Secretary of Labor has the power to regulate, but that abolish. Eh? Only Congress can abolish that. Has the power to regulate the practice of contracting the subcontracting. And that's exactly what he was doing. Even his predecessors, like Secretary Baldos, tried to do that. As a matter of fact, every secretary, as far as I know, back to even nearest confessor, to Robin Torres, they tried to explain and amplify that through the issuances of Dios. But because of this controversy, because of the promise by Secretary, I mean, President Digong that he would abolish contractualization, this time the DO issuance, issuance was more strict and was more, gives more importance and assure the security of tenure of the people and that they are entitled to labor standards as required by law. Thank But there is nothing illegal with that. So there is no need to change that. The problem that we have right now, Roland, is the, 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 the issue of contextualization has been politicized. And our legislators, not only the lower house, but sadly, even in the Senate, they want to amend, they want to touch that, they want to tamper that because they want to be so-called, the so-called champion of the labor masses. But they're not doing a favor to the workers, because if they want to abolish this or to become it to 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 enact a law that will be very very strict, that really it will impede outsourcing, that is anti-employment, that is anti-investment, because people will lose their jobs and people, the foreign investors will be discouraged from investing here in the Philippines. 
So they should be very careful that. That's the problem. Our legislators should be aware that we are calling that when it comes to foreign direct investment in Southeast Asia. Tatatalo pa nga tayo sa Vietnam. I'm pretty sure makatalo tayo sa, sa Cambodia. What is, the, what is our dollar? Before, before, uh, before the pandemic, what is the highest foreign direct investment uh, uh, in terms of dollars we have? It was between 5 to 8 billion. That's peanuts compared to Singapore, a city-state where they're number one for the foreign direct investment among the ASEAN countries. Between 60 to 80 billion dollars a year. Malaysia is a small country. They have about 40 to 60 billion dollars a year. Thailand is about 30. Indonesia is almost about that. Vietnam has surpassed us a long time ago. And one of the major reasons is because our laws are not friendly to foreign direct investments. And if we change this, if you remove the flexibility of employers to hire contractuals, because they must be aware that there are seasonal operations. Even our, our malls, you know, that they need more people when it comes with the coming, when the Christmas is coming, or the Valentine is coming, or when graduation day is coming, because there are more shoppers. But after that, off-season, they don't need those people. So they must have flexibility. I'll give you a very glaring example. In the sugar industry, The season is November. They cut all the canes. After that, they don't need the sugar cane cutters anymore. And then the milling season starts in January, February, and March. After the milling season, the regular employees stay. And if there are no operations, they do the maintenance. But the so-called outsourced employees must be dispensed with. So these are the realities of business. That's why contractualization is needed because of the seasonal aspects of our businesses. Therefore, you have to give them flexibility and ease of dispensing these employees who are no longer needed for that particular season. And the Supreme Court recognized that. In a landmark decision, I think that was San Miguel Corporation, the Supreme Court recognized the prerogative of the employer to fix terms, to hire, to lay off, to discipline, to terminate employees under as required by law. As long as they follow the procedure, the substantive procedural due process and the procedural due process, they are not in danger of being declared as committing an illegal act. Okay. On that note, Attorney Payos, I am glad that you uh, emphasize the aspect of competition and uh, flexibility. And at this point, may we ask you for your parting words to our ECOP audience? Yes. Uh, my words is that the labor code, remember the labor code was born out of martial law many decades ago. Martial law was declared in 72. It was enacted, it was promulgated by the dictator because that is part of his extant powers. He acts as the executive department. He also acts as the, as the legislative department. So he issued promulgation decree, presidential decree 442, and enacted this law. This law was a hotspot of about 60 labor laws at the time put into one so-called labor code, which includes the minimum wage law, the termination pay law, the eight-hour labor law, and the others. Of course, there are, there are laws, special laws that are not covered by the labor code, like the sexual harassment law, the 13 man pay law, SSS, and the others. But by and large, most of our labor social legislation are included in this labor code. Now, since this was enacted or promulgated in the 1970s, before globalization, before the internet, before the digitalization, this is now largely obsolete. Therefore, having said that, the labor code really needs very badly elevation in order to respond to the changing times. We are now in the fourth revolution. 
We are now in the digital age. At the time, there was no internet. So of some of these provisions are now antiquated and absolute, are no longer applicable. They are not practical. And therefore, there's a revision. Sadly, it has undergone several attempts. The UPNO Center, other associations have tried to make a revision, but it's all just in the revision stage talk. It has to be submitted to Congress. I hope that it is only. It can be submitted. I understand PMAP has submitted their own revision uh, done by uh, Undersecretary, former Undersecretary, my good friend, Joseph Jimenez. And there is also Yukon Center that probably is already submitting to Congress. So let's hope that eventually there should be a revision of the Labor Code because these are obsolete. This is obsolete. It is not in keeping with the times. It is not in keeping the times, and therefore, it is no longer relevant. Some of the provisions are no longer relevant, relevant to the changing times. True, it has undergone piecemeal amendments, but these are not enough. The whole, the whole labor code must be viewed in the macro level, and I think all antiquated archaic provisions should be expands from the provisions, and new provisions should be should be put there in order that it be really a real, modern, responsive labor home to the changing times. That is my last word. On that note, uh, Attorney Payas, we thank you very much for your views and insights. Good night. and uh, Thank you, safe. too. It was my pleasure to be with you in this very important uh, uh, interview. Congratulations for your view program. Mabuhay ang eko. Mabuhay kayo lahat. Thank you very much, Attorney Payos. Keep safe. Before we proceed to our last guest for tonight, mga ka we will be right back after this segment. I join ECOP to gain value for my business, be informed on latest industry developments and for assistance or support on company operational concerns and problems. There are a lot I learned uh, from ECOP, uh, the creation of Venture through LearnWise of the Wadwani Foundation and uh, soft skills training and uh, responsible business conduct. In there, I gain uh, knowledge and uh, friends too, and uh, trainers who are well experienced. The ECOP services that I like most were the trainings and programs they offer for businesses. Uh, ECOP has helped my company in dealing with work-related issues, management compliance, and best practices at workplace. Yes, I would recommend that. And uh, we're back. Welcome again to Echo Plus, amplifying your voice. I am Jose Roland Moya, and uh, let me introduce our last guest for tonight, Attorney Arnold. De Vera, labor law practitioner and law professor at the Ateneo de Manila University. Hello, sir. Welcome to Echo Plus, amplifying your voice. Please say hello to our Echo Plus, amplifying your voice viewers. Thank you very much, Sir Roland, Attorney Enzo. Glad to be here. For good evening. Good evening, Attorney Arnie. Good evening. Uh, Attorney Arnie, uh, you have been teaching labor law for quite a while. Um, are the laws and jurisprudence on security of tenure easy to understand? Well, first, for the students, and second, for the common workers, for the ordinary workers. Thank you for that question, Attorney Enzo. Uh, I will not say that it's easy, but I think it's uh, manageable. 
to be learned. No? One uh, thing that facilitates learning about our uh, regime of security of tenure is the fact that we have them in statutes, in our books, in our labor code, as well as implementing rules and regulations by the Department of Labor and Employment. Just recently, the uh, Department of Labor and Employment was able to collate a lot of the case law uh, written by the Supreme Court in a uh, consolidated department order where I can uh, point uh, students to refer to. However, at the same time, having said that, uh, it's easier actually for workers to appreciate what our security of tenure provisions mean because they usually live this out in their own lives. No? Uh, totoo sa kanila. Yung mga tanong, yung mga sagot din ng Supreme Court no? sa kanila mga kaso, ay sinasabuhay nila, kaya madali application. I have had a good fortune of teaching uh, evening students as well, who uh, aside from studying, also work uh, either full-time or part-time. I found that their experience at work helps them uh, understand labor law, including security of tenure, pretty well, or better than if it's just uh, learned through books. Okay. Uh, in your uh, as a labor lawyer, what uh, have your experiences been uh, with regard to security of tenure? What are the most difficult areas uh, of uh, conflict between uh, employers and uh, employees? Well, currently and siguro in the past uh, several years, uh, the biggest source of uh, conflict really is uh, the misclassification of workers. No? It starts from uh, when workers feel that they are already employees of particular uh, establishments and uh, they are subsequently told that they are not employees but are employees of somebody else. Uh, in practice, this could mean that they are either uh, considered as independent contractors and therefore not employees or are considered as employees of other em uh, employers, uh, such as in an agency or tripartite arrangement. There is another uh, method of misclassification, where uh, workers who are already considered as employers by establishments are told that they are not regular employees, but some other kind of, uh, uh, under some other kind of employment arrangement where they will not attain regular uh, employment. So this could either be under a project employment uh, uh, arrangement or a uh, fixed term employment arrangement. And under those arrangements, uh, this uh, arise, uh, there arises confusion, if not conf outright conflict, as to what the rights of the employees are, especially in both cases, uh, whether they are misclassified as non-employees or misclassified as non-regular employees, uh, conflict arises uh, usually at the time when they are terminated or, or when they lose their jobs. So you refer to certain uh, misclassifications or arrangements uh, and labeling uh, this relationship between workers and employers. Do you feel that this is a widespread uh, malpractice? <laughs> That's actually a very good question. Uh, in uh, my participation in tripartite bodies, whether in the executive with the Department of Labor and Employment or in uh, legislative hearings, this is the same question that uh, we've been asking the Department of Labor and Employment to monitor. Uh, I, can, I can answer the question in two parts. One way is uh, to cite uh, official government statistics. However, the Department of Labor and Employment has not given us, uh, me for example, any firm uh, idea on, for example, on the number of subcontracted workers. Uh, they have uh, given us different numbers depending on the occasion that uh, they were giving us the information. Second, on just my own level, uh, by experiences in giving seminars or uh, uh, talks to uh, workers themselves, the misclassification seems to be uh, very prevalent. Uh, workers, I uh, encountered and talked to and discussed this with, uh, tell me about their own experience as well as experiences of their colleagues within the same workplace. I can only think of a very rare uh, occasions where uh, they do not uh, experience either the misclassification of as non-workers or as non-regular employees. Attorney De Vera, uh, bakit yeah. nangyayari po itong uh, misclassification? 
as a labor leader and as a law practitioner, how do you think should employers approach uh, the issue of uh, security of tenure? Uh, that's, a, that's a very complicated uh, question, sir. I hope to address it uh, competently. Well, dun sa question muna, sir, ng bakit ginagawa, I can only surmise, no? And I can only echo to you what I've heard from employers because that's best left to the employers to explain. Uh, the formal answer that I've uh, received is, number one, uh, employers like the flexibility that uh, these non-regular or non-employment uh, arrangements uh, give them. Uh, sa mas simple pong uh, paraan siguro ng pagpapaliwanag, merong benepisyo yung mga employer dun sa pawis at paggawa ng mga manggagawa. Pero at the same time, hindi nila consider na em employee. Therefore, pag bumaba, eh, siguro yung pangangailangan nila doon sa dami ng tao na kailangan nilang magtrabaho sa kanila, mas madali yung flexibility ng sinasabi para sa kanila, para sa mga employer na magbawas ng mga tao. Yun po yung una, no? Yung pangalawa na naririnig ko na po sa mga employer na nagpapaliwanag uh, tungkol dito ay employers like the specialization that this will afford them. Specialization means usually yung pagkaunawa ko po sa paliwanag nila sa akin, kaya ng mga employer sumentro o mag-focus o magpatampok lamang doon sa kanilang mga tinatawag nila core competencies that they would not need to train or maintain personnel who do uh, jobs or work which are not part of uh, what they consider as their core competencies. They can assign them, they can uh, engage other uh, third-party suppliers, for example, of personnel in order for those services to be rendered. So, yun na po, although tentative lagi po ako dyan kasi I would uh, rather hear the employers uh, justify the practice. No? In terms of... Uh, what I would suggest the employers to do, syempre, ang uh, continuing naman pong advocacy natin, ay sana mag-usap. No? I've had uh, a lot of experience where the employers impose, uh, formulate and impose management prerogative or management decisions without talking to their workers, no? whether regular or non-regular or whatever they call their workers. Understanding starts from dialogue and if you talk to the workers, Simple lang naman po yung mga gusto nila eh. Pag sinabi natin security of tenure, ang totoo po mukha niyan sa mga manggagawa ay walang alilangan doon sa haharapin nila bukas. Kasi syempre, meron silang ginagastos, meron silang uh, inuutang, meron silang binubuhay. Gusto naman nila, may kasiguruhan sila na bukas or next week or sa susunod na buwan, ay kaya pa rin po nilang tustusan yung mga yun. Simple lang naman po, no? Kung magkaintindihan muna sila sa ganong klaseng level, maunawaan ng employer siguro na mahalaga sa empleyado na manatili sa trabaho at manatili yung kakayanan niyang uh, mabuhay, ay baka that's a good first step. No? Rather than imposing uh, self-formulated uh, employer prerogative just upon employees who are simply asked to uh, live out the effects. No? So yun po yung siguro on a very small uh, micro level. No? On, siguro sa collective, uh, magandang patuloy natin pag-usapan ano bang arrangements talaga po ang pwede. No? I mean, the older labor leaders uh, uh, always uh, like to recall uh, times past when regular employment was the norm, when regular employment actually worked. No? So, uh, regular and direct employment would still be the norm now. Ang tanungan lang po sa dialogues natin is, what about the uh, arrangement? Would the employers uh, want to be uh, changed? Uh, how, how, how do they still attain flexibility or specialization, the ones that uh, I've mentioned before, that I've heard from them? How can they still achieve that at the same time, uh, achieving also the rights of the workers under our constitution and under our law, including security of pay? Yeah, at Attorney Arnie, in an earlier question posed by Attorney Enzo, you made mention of uh, the trilateral or tripartite uh, relationship uh, uh, based to ata ito doon sa isang regulasyon na pinalabas ng Department of Labor and Employment. Ito yung Department Order Number 174. Um, do you think uh, Department Order 174 on contracting and subcontracting uh, strengthens the right 
to security of uh, tenure? Uh, why or why not? I think uh, the best way that I can assess the uh, well, uh, how good a, a regulation it is, is to simply judge it by its effects. You know? uh, we will try to uh, see the tree for its fruits. Uh, from the time that it was issued in 2017 up to the present, uh, the labor sector has not seen any change in the way that workers are being treated under that particular department order. Uh, so in that way, um, the labor sector does not see DO-174 uh, very favorably. Uh, so why not? There may be many reasons. One thing that I can point to immediately is that it still allows the same things that its uh, predecessor department orders allowed. You know, it did not change anything uh, significant with regard to the regime of trilateral hiring of uh, workers. In fact, uh, ang isang usually pong uh, tinuturo dyan na pagbabago ng D174 ay pagtataas lamang ng kapital, ng, uh, kapital ng uh, subcontractor mula sa 3 million ginawang 5 million. Uh, practitioners know very well the change is actually cosmetic more than anything because a lot of the contractors are already uh, well capitalized above 5 million. So it's more the uh, uh, fact that trilateral arrangements continue to exist in a very relaxed manner and applicable to work which is actually supposed to be regular and direct in many instances. Uh, let me be uh, a little bit uh, closer to the ground. Uh, during this pandemic, well, one of the uh, initiatives uh, by the Department of Labor was to allow or issue a department order allowing for low for uh, establishments affected by the circumstances brought about by the pandemic. As a legal practitioner, uh, have you encountered any complaints or any unique uh, issues uh, brought about by the pandemic? Well, I, I, I would not say it's unique. Uh, let me answer that first by saying that uh, with regard to furlough, uh, kinilala lang naman po nung department order, I think it's 215, ng Department of Labor and Employment. Uh, yung matagal nang nandyan sa ating uh, labor code, na suspension of operations. I think yun yung tuntungan ng department order nila. Where uh, suspension of operations by the employers will be allowed not exceeding six months. So, nung nagsimula po yan, no March 2020 at in-implement, uh, we were just keeping uh, in line with what has been uh, applied before in non-pandemic uh, situations such as, for example, in floating status, in uh, instances where employers are undergoing uh, repairs. So, in-impose lang po nila yan doon sa unique situation of pandemic. Now, the second portion siguro po, no, I'll, I'll just, uh, without naming names of course, uh, I have uh, uh, this employer who have had uh, uh, to resort to identifying comorbidities of workers in order to prevent them from coming back to work. This despite the fact that they are visibly, uh, physically able to work. And yet, uh, with the prevalence of uh, in maybe social media and other forms of media, of uh, the discussions on comorbidities, they made that as a... Uh, ground in order to prevent them from these are already regular workers these are regular workers already who've been working with them for with on the same task for a long time the employer allowed many other people to uh, report for work but pointed to the, to their comorbidities uh, for example uh, one was told uh, that he was obese another one was told that he had uh, diabetes uh, and then these were the reasons for them to be prevented from reporting back to work at a no work, no pay uh, uh, arrangement. So that's, uh, I hope it's unique. Uh, I hope not all employers are doing that. 
But it's also very sad for the employer, uh, employees who are very willing to work, go back to work, and yet are prevented from doing so. Nitong pandemic, uh, Attorney Rivera, napansin ko yung naging mas uh, tuloy-tuloy na pag-uusap, pagkakaroon ng dialogo between uh, the labor sector at saka mga employers. At ito ay nagbunga ng maraming uh, pagkakasundo sa maraming issue. So bago natin tapusin ang interview sa iyo, you may want uh, to have your parting words. Hello, Mr. Roland. In fact, uh, I confirm uh, what you're saying no? for the large, large part. I have, I have been a happy participant po pag uh, yung mga workers ay uh, nakikipagdialogo, nakikipagtulungan uh, productively with their employers. No? Uh, however, I also have to flag, no? may mga malulungkot din tayong mga pagkakataon kung saan ginamit din naman yung pandemya na, pa, na dahilan hindi para magtulungan, kundi kung ano yung mga dati ng mga naging hidwaan o hindi pagkakaunawaan, the conflicts that uh, existed pre-pandemic, uh, worsened. No? Uh, and the pandemic uh, gave uh, a stage for either loss of jobs, unemployment, and even violence. No? Meron ng mga very violent acts po nangyari since March 2020. No? And uh, I guess my parting words is uh, still very hopeful. Uh, the work we do is uh, inherently an optimistic one in that uh, there is a uh, better tomorrow uh, hindi lang dahil ang uh, employers are open to dialogue and cooperation but also because workers are uh, confident enough in order to reach for their rights and try to maintain and protect them. Salamat po sa pagkakataong ito. Thank you very much, Attorney Rivera. Uh, more power to you and uh, uh, Godspeed in your service to the, uh, to the workers of this country. Maraming salamat, Attorney Rivera. Uh, keep safe. Salamat din po. At manatili tayo lahat na ligtas. Let's have a short break for the Echo Plus Amplifying Your Voice Netizens Q&A. Bulong-bulong ating isipan Ang gagawin hindi malaman Sari-saring pagpipilian Nabasa kung saan-saan Maraming iba, iba China, Europa Amerika, India at Russia Lahat magagaling at kung tatanungin Ang mauna ang tanggapin
are now in the Echo Plus Netizens Corner segment of the show. Let's take a question from our netizens from ECOP social media account. This one is a question posted in ECOP's uh, Facebook page. And uh, the question goes this way. I am May Ann, a business owner from Lipa City. Sang ayon sa Labor Code of the Philippines, ang isang bagong empleyado ay dapat maging regular matapos ang anim na buwang paninilbihan. Pwede bang ma-extend ang probationary period beyond six months kung sakaling yung standards of performance sa kanyang posisyon ay hindi naabot ng empleyado? Ayaw ko kasi siyang tanggalin at gusto ko siyang bigyan ng another chance. Attorney Enzo, uh, bagay sa iyo itong uh, katanungan ito. Uh, maari bang sagutin mo ang uh-huh. tanong ni May Ann? Oo. Uh, maliwanag sa labor code na kung ang isang empleyado ay kinuha para sa isang regular na posisyon, uh, matapos siyang makapagsilbi ng anim na buwan, siya ay dapat na maging isang regular na empleyado na uh, sa isang kaso, nilinaw na ang anim na buwan na ito ay katumbas ng isang daan at walumpong araw, 180 days. Uh, pag sumobra ng isang araw doon, automatic na kaagad yon na magigis na siyang regular employee. Uh, nabanggit mo na yung isang empleyado mo na nahihirapan ka ay hindi pumapasa sa mga pamantayan na iyong Uh, itinalaga sa umpisa pa man. Tama yun, uh, kinakailangan sa umpisa pa lang maliwanag kung ano yung mga pamantayan na dapat niyang tuparin at dapat niyang gawin. Kasi kung hindi maliwanag ang pamantayan ito, ay hindi naman ito uh, patas para doon sa manggagawa. Pangalawa, itong uh, Itong pagpapalawig ng probationary period, may, may mga uh, desisyon ang Korte Suprema na pinapayagan ito. Pero ito ay hindi dapat na nagiging pangkaralingwan. Ito ay dapat uh, may maliwanag na dahilan kung bakit uh, papalawigin pa o papahabain pa yung probationary period. Kasi kung ito ay ginagawa sa lahat ng empleyado, maaaring ito ay sabihin na isang uh, pagtatago lamang ng uh, employer para maiwasan ang pagiging regular ng kanyang probationary employee. So, kinakailangan malinaw yung pamantayan at pangalawa, ito ay may malaking kadahilanan kung bakit gagawin at saka ito ay pinag-uusapan dapat ng manggagawa at saka ng uh, namumuhunan. Attorney Enzo, nabanggit mo kanina na sa ilang desisyon ng Korte Suprema ay uh, sinabing uh, pwede naman palawigin yung probationary period. Ano po ba itong mga sitwasyon kung saan pwede uh, palawigin ang probationary period? Oo, oo. Yung probationary period kasi, uh, ito ay itinatalaga uh, para uh, uh, ma-evaluate ng uh, employer yung kakayahan ng uh, kanyang probationary employee. On the other hand, ito rin ay panahon upang tingnan ng, emple- ng empleyado kung uh, magugustuhan niya ba ang uh, pananatili sa trabahong iyon. Uh, ngayon, kinakailangan malinaw uh, sa umpisa pa lang ng probationary period, malinaw doon sa probationary employee kung ano yung pagbabatayan sa evaluation ng kanyang performance. At saka, dapat uh, merong periodic uh, feedback doon sa probationary employee kung ano ang kalagayan ng kanyang uh, pagtatrabaho. Uh, siguro, matapos ang pangatlong buwan o kaya matapos ang kalimang buwan, sasabihan dapat siya kung kulang pa ba o uh, napakahusay ng kanyang trabaho. Hindi pa pwede yon na kung kailan mag-aanim na buwan na, saka lang siya sasabihan na ay hindi ka kumakasa. Kasi parang uh, para-paraan, maaring sabihin na para-paraan lang yon para hindi maging regular employee yung, uh, yung probationary employee. At iniiwasan lang ng employer na magkaroon ng isa pang karagdagang regular na employee. 
Salamat sa iyong question, Mean ng Lipa City. Sana nasagot ito ni Attorney Enzo Ziga. For our netizens, kanina binanggit namin ang Echo Plus question for the day na dapat abangan para manalo ng papremyo. Ito po ang Echo Plus question for the day. Anong bilang ng department order ang inilabas ng Department of Labor and Employment noong 2017 upang i-regulate ang contracting at subcontracting? Ito ang mechanics ng Echo Plus question for the day. I-comment ang sagot sa Facebook account ng Echo. Hashtag Echo Plus Amplifying Your Voice Space Your Answer Space Anong title ng episode na ito? Don't forget to like and share ang episode na ito sa Echo Facebook page. Ang mapipiling mananalo ay inonotify sa Echo Facebook page at bibigyan namin ng instructions para makuha ang premyo. Thank you very much Under Secretary Benavides, Attorney Payos, and Attorney Rivera for your time. Keep safe. Salamat sa nagtanong kay Mean ng Lipa City. Huwag niyo pong kalilimutan sagutin ang question for the day para manalo ng premyo. ECOP is here to ensure that your voice as employers is heard, articulated, and acted upon. ECHO promotes social dialogue, enhances engagement with employers and stakeholders, expounds on its policy positions, and tackles industrial relations issues. We are here to pave the way for employers to become responsible, sustainable, and inclusive. Mga ka -Echo, I'm your host, Jose Roland Moya, with my co-host, Attorney Lorenzo Enzo Ziga. See you every other Monday at 5.30 p.m. sa next episode ng Echo Plus Amplifying Your Voice. Keep safe and God bless.